What lies beneath our feet in some ways is known to us, but in other ways, it's always been kind of a complete mystery. While we would love to think that we have this rock figured out, along with all the species on it, how things work concerning the atmosphere, even to like burning fossil fuels, and what that does or does not do to the environment, the reality is, we don't really have a clue. Just theories and politics, as the late Sergeant Johnson once said. And that has never been more true than in this moment in time, if you think about it. A few days ago, it was announced that we had found a type of rock called ringwoodite and it appears to house roughly three times the amount of water that is in all of our oceans combined. Now the thing to remember is this isn't like a sloshing ocean beneath our feet, but because of the heat and pressure, the water is pushed into this rock. And this has completely called into question if water just seeped up from the ground to create our oceans, or if it really was like comets and asteroids that supplied all this water. Or possibly if it was just even a combination. Either way, this is brand new information and it further highlights just how little humanity knows about what's going on around us, or for that matter, even what's underneath us. With this in mind, eerily, it tracks with today's topic, really. In the events of underwater, humanity is doing what humanity always does, and is trying to get that sweet, sweet oil, which is another thing seemingly we do not understand, as it's hypothesized to apparently come from dinosaurs, but really that's a myth. They say it comes from marine plants and animals, but the question is, how do you even test that? I'm sorry, three times the ocean being 400 miles below our feet has completely made me question reality at this point in time. As a company has discovered crude oil deep within the ocean, rather than do like the normal thing and just send a drill down there and have a platform above the waves, they plant a drilling facility deep below the waves where a crew would man the platforms and continue supplying what the world needed. Kind of makes you wonder if there was an ulterior motive to this, doesn't it? However, after hitting a pocket deep in the crust, something would be released that would threaten to destroy the facility and everyone contained within. But how could anything survive down there and what sort of effects would it have on their physiology? Well, let's discuss that in today's episode over the movie Underwater. Hello everybody and thank you for watching. If you enjoy, leaving a like is always great and subscribing, you get notified of when I upload. I've got merchandise at RoanoakMerch.com. If anybody's interested in that, I really do appreciate you guys supporting the channel. If you're just watching, I mean, that's the biggest thing. Otherwise, uh, the channel dies. So it's definitely appreciated. Thank you, and I hope that you enjoy the video. So we kick off our story with the knowledge that Kirsten Stewart is in this movie, so prepare yourself accordingly. We get some news flashes about immense pressure, which is like around 8 PSI, and how there are rumors of strange sightings at the drill site, but the company is like, nah, you're crazy, there's not bipedal monsters down there with other forms exhibiting deep sea gigantism. Also, they do not know what the effects of extended deep sea pressures are on the human body at this point, which falls in line much like how we don't or didn't really know what the effects of no gravity in space would be, but spoiler alert, it appears to waste away our bones and muscle, but it does however lengthen our telomeres, which is the genetic material at the end of our chromosomes, which is incredibly interesting uh, given that lengthening those could stave off aging as every time a cell undergoes mitosis, some of that is cut off until it starts hitting like important genes, rendering a cell non-functional. Also fun fact, around 28, your body starts dying. I'm 31, I'm blowing up any day now. So as we follow the pipe down into my nightmare, a pitch black ocean, all I can say is no thanks. I have tracked my own fear of murky and dark water back to when I was a kid at the beach actually. I was swimming with my brother next to a pier, my old man was on the pier, and the water was stirred up from the waves. I couldn't see anything around my feet or even just like below the surface. And I felt something huge swim past me and then run into my leg. I saw my dad freaking out above me if I remember correctly on the pier. It's all a little fuzzy considering it was a blindingly fearful inducing experience that my brain was in. But anyhow, uh, like negative a million out of 10 experience to this day, I don't know what it was, but it's the type of fear that's just permanently embedded into your nervous system. Moving on. Welcome to Kepler Station. There's a distant boom with several other actual booms happening in the distance and the lights start to flicker. Kirsten Stewart gets up and brushes her teeth, talking about how you lose a sense of time down here because it's always dark. She catches a spider and releases it as clearly the structure is having issues around her. She goes to look down the hallway and as she does, the structure starts leaking above her head. Not a good sign. Pretty much immediately, which I can appreciate this movie for, it begins collapsing all around her as the hole was breached. She begins noping out of there as Rodrigo follows her as they try to get the pressure door sealed. Two other crew members come running out as they try to get to them, but they are consumed by the briny depth. They close the doors on them, and that's that, Mrs. That's That, except it's not. A straight-up explosion happens, knocking her out, along with Rodrigo. They wake up with the same tinnitus I have, which is mega annoying. Like, welcome to that super happy fun time. It's the loudest at night when you're trying to sleep, because of course it is. They check the computer as they call out to control with the whole 70% compromised. They hear a rumbling noise as they try to get to a more stable portion of the facility. Heading towards the pods, they get the computer going as Rodrigo says, Oh, it wasn't our fault for closing the door. We could have lost the whole structure otherwise. Fault? 
Absolutely not. Action you had to complete? Yes. Finding Pods and CR7, they crawl through the rubble and find Paul trapped under the concrete. Freeing him, they continue to crawl in the mega claustrophobic conditions as they find another crew member, McKellen, but she's mega dunzo having been crushed by said rubble. Ouchies. It's not a pleasant way to go. I don't know why, but that reminds me of like Gears 4 when Kate starts getting crushed by a literal building falling on her before Cole finds her in the mech. Sounds pretty horrific. Getting back to standing conditions, they find the captain in the evac pod area as the door is jammed. Nora is able to get the door open as the captain says they have no idea what caused this. Also, you're going to find that in this facility, like, I'm not even OSHA certified or anything, but there's like a lot of things that I'm like, okay, I would change this, 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 and this. Like, why can you not access the door opening mechanism from the inside of the pod area? That doesn't make any sense. And don't worry, I'll complain more about that other stuff later. But anyways, like I was saying, the captain has no idea what caused this. It's probably not Cthulhu, so don't worry about it. But he stayed behind while sending 22 pods up, and that's why they don't have any left here. Nora then tells him that he should have gone up as he has an offspring, but he says the captain needs to stay with the ship. And someone needs to tell that to Captain Francesco Chettino, I believe, of the Concordia. You are supposed to stay on the ship until everyone is off, like this Alpha Chad, simply known as Captain. And if you have no idea who I'm talking about, go look up Internet Historian with the Concordia. It'll pop up. He's got a great video over it, and the dude's hilarious. In Mission Control, the place is barely holding together with pressures. Emily the Intern, or Research Assistant as they're called, I don't know, I was just called Intern back in the day at all the jobs I've worked, talked about how the structure is about to implode and they need to get out of there, but there are no pods. And with the inability to swim their way out, because apparently at those depths you don't just float up, you have to fight for every inch of vertical ascent, they're finding it difficult to see any way to survive this. With all the lamenting and brain racking going on, eventually they remember there's a defunct research outpost known as the Roebuck Station, but it's a mile away, at the bottom of the sea, in the pitch black. And with things like the colossal squid and anglerfish that can get up to 3.3 feet long, with the largest one weighing 126 pounds 6 ounces, it's like a large Rottweiler with larger teeth attacking you. God, I hate the deep sea. They will have to put on their suits and walk the abysmal depths in complete blackness following that pipe. Bro, absolutely horrendous. Anytime you have to follow a plateau under the ocean, you're gonna have a bad time. And actually, this is a good way to kind of segue into the fact people keep asking for Subnautica. No, I play that game and it gives me chronic anxiety. <laughs> it has got to be the most almond activating game I have ever played in my life. Anyhow, luckily another site of the structure reported in to let them know what the status is over there. Ah, good, it's all screaming. And once the people have been turned into human paste after the structure imploded, the recorder then picks up the sound of something growling. Nobody knows what it is, but they really have no option but to go for the roebuck. Honestly, it's probably the anglerfish. It planted that recording because, you know, it is the way that it is. They put on their suits, which are basically Mjolnirs, which is pretty cool. Like, if we created those, we need to start throwing those things into combat scenarios with armoring is all I'm saying. As everyone gets their suits on, they're ready to head into the drink and absolutely not be eaten by monsters. And not even just normal monsters that live down there like we know of, which is the anglerfish. Emily has a nice freak out for a moment as everyone gets ready to lock and load Brides of Christ, and as they hit the cargo elevator base, Rodrigo's helmet starts cracking as they let in the pressure. Nora screams to keep the door closed, but it's too late as Rodrigo gets ocean gated almost immediately due to the pressure failure within his suit. This implosion blasts everyone out as apparently the suit releases pressure too, which I don't think an implosion would do that, but then again, I've never been to the depths of the ocean and had an implosive event. But now that I'm back on the second day, continuing my writing, these suits appear to be like mega pressurized. Obviously they would need to be to contend with the pressures outside, but I still feel like a crack in the suit would be letting pressure out, not holding it in, which allowed for the suit to implode in the first place. Like this is a weird one. Anyhow, Nora looks out into the pitch black, which absolutely again, no. And then she jumps down the elevator as they reach some more air. She says Rodrigo knew the helmet was faulty, and I don't know about that one, bro. That sounds like a massive cope. If I were Rodrigo, I would have probably just taken my chances on staying on that structure or in it. So as they descend to the next elevator, they get an alarm that there could be a survivor based on an escape pod in the area. Paul tells Emily it's her time to shine, which freaks her out, which then he hands her the bunny, also known as Little Paul, as they go to check for survivors. Emily asks the captain how old his youngling is, and he says 14. Nora says, no, she's not that old anymore, as Emily says, oh, it's normal for neurological reactions when facing your own mortality. But is it? The reality is yes. The brain is a fairly complex piece of fat and meat. 
During events where you are faced with your own mortality, your body is going to be dumping adrenaline into your bloodstream. This fight, flight, freeze, or fawn response is going to have some pretty profound impacts on your biochemistry, as well as your neurological interactions. The first thing to note is your breathing rate is going to increase, and this is going to oxygenate your blood better and get more of that oxygen to your brain and muscles in order to make decisions for fight for survival. However, while you can make decisions, your brain isn't necessarily up for the task of pleasant conversation. In a life or death scenario, there's this idea that if you talk to somebody about something else, you can keep them calm. While this is like somewhat true, the idea is that you can actively see areas of the brain that are not associated with survival take somewhat of a back seat. Anything not directly associated with helping you remain intact and keeping you alive is not important during this specific time frame. Things like your frontal lobe, for instance, would be working triple overtime to work out plans, make decisions, and slam the emotional brakes in your brain, keeping you controlled, even facing this crisis. And that's why people are able to make like basically horrific choices, especially when they have adrenaline pumping through them, but they're sitting there shaking. It's pretty interesting watching the body do what it does, but other areas of the brain, such as the hippocampus, would not be as important, at least in this specific scenario, which may seem odd, right? Shouldn't memory be something your brain goes back to? Well, in a situation that it has survived before, yes, memory is highly important, but if it's a completely new situation, not really. When terrified, your brain has excellent memory. It needs to remember the thing that almost took it out should you ever encounter that thing again, making you better at dealing with it in the future. However, in this scenario, the captain has never dealt with anything like this. And because of that, the hippocampus has no information to offer and therefore is relegated to a secondary role. So asking someone who is in a terrified state about something in their past, they may not as effectively recall the memory properly, not to mention they're not even thinking about something like that, so they're kind of autopilot answering. Which in this instance, we can see this actively happening. This has nothing really to do with the event at all, I just like talking about the brain, and hopefully you understand more about the chemoelectric anxiety meat in your skull now. Of course, the captain has another reason for miscalling the age of his offspring, but we'll get to that later. Heading back outside, they move towards the pod, but can't seem to locate it in the inky blackness. Probably because an anglerfish ate it. As they do, they hear something around them, but they aren't sure what it is, anglerfish. Approaching it, they eventually find the pod, but nobody is inside. The pod, however, is completely torn apart. It's clear someone used it to escape, it was grabbed and then ripped open. As they turn back, they do find something, however. Looking at this person's back, they see a shimmering and the broken skin as something clearly attacked him as it then just comes out at them and they're forced to take it out by popping a shot at it. They bring it inside and take a look, but can't seem to find its mouth very easily. It has no eyes and is covered in tendrils with talons on them. Emily suggests this is a brand new species, and they may have bored into a hydrothermal pocket and released this thing. Getting a good look at it though, it should be clear that this isn't a creature that ripped the pod open. However, we see some fairly strange features on this organism. Starting with the tendrils, there are quite a few of them on the lower half of the body, and they all possess talons on them. In fact, it actually kind of looks like a cephalopod more than anything, and where this animal was discovered, it really takes on some strange features. But those are further up the meat suit. Around the torso area, we can see that it's not just tendrils that it appears to have, but also arms and hands. These types of hands are reminiscent of primate hands, actually, which would be alarming to any human looking at this. But I think there may be an idea that can help to explain these creatures in some sense, but it's much more likely to be a different hypothesis that I have on this species in general. And this is clearly a youngling given its size and what we will compare to it later. The body is cylindrical in shape, like a tube almost at this age, terminating at the head of the animal that is actually fairly large given its body mass, giving it a high brain to body ratio, indicating there is a chance this animal, as well as the older variants, are quite intelligent, or at least somewhat intelligent. Brain to body mass ratio isn't like a hard and fast rule to go off of though, but typically it works, and it works enough that we can use it here. The face of the youngling possesses no eyes, but interestingly, we do see that it has a brow ridge with areas that we would assume to be where the eyes may have once been. The skin is pale and said to be much like an amphibian's, which is also fairly strange, but would make sense when we discuss the two possibilities that this species may hail from. The elevator lights go off at this point as something is on the outside of it. As they listen, they know something is there, but they don't know where it is exactly, but clearly it's testing for weaknesses. Paul goes to close the other door as the elevator continues to shudder by something outside. Facing the flashlight up, they see the creature as the structure above them finally explodes, dropping them into the depths. Now this has completely marked them and shown at least a hint of intellect in the species that they are currently being attacked by. The animal on the outside located a window and was also much larger than the one on the table. You know, for all we know, it could have been like the species offspring, meaning that there is a personal grudge this specific being may have now. And from what we will see, 
This thing goes ham on the team because of it. They quickly get on their suits as then they hit the ground and then start running from the falling debris, much like you do in a dream when you can't run very fast. That must be really annoying. Running into the planes with whatever that thing outside the window is being around them the whole time, the structure is coming down on them as they make their way towards Midway Station and head inside, all running low on air. In the haste to get away, Smith's oxygen scrubber was damaged, almost leading to his end. And then almost immediately, the creatures began attacking the Midway structure. They get the lights turned on as they gain access to the transporter and then continue through the tunnel that was damaged, which has a ton of water in it, which apparently the transporter cannot get through, so I guess the ride's over, as they hear the creatures on the outside of the tunnel continuing to test for weaknesses and entry points. And considering water is leaking in, there are plenty of weak points. Moving through, they find quite possibly the most unkillable thing ever, the company that creates moon pies. Seriously, I have never seen anyone ever buy a moon pie, but somehow they're just absolutely thriving. Like, I'm not hating. I just don't know how they do it. Anyhow, as they continue through the water, eventually the ceiling gets so low that they had to put back on their helmets to move through the water completely submerged. They connect their lines and descend under the surface, coming up on the other side. One by one, they make their way through as Smith goes through, but not before getting said moon pie, leaving Paul as the last person. He then hears a metallic clang as the creatures have entered the tunnel. They begin pulling Paul through as he gets stuck and are able to bring him pretty much all the way over on the other side, but as they do, however, he gets grabbed. Something on the other side is trying to drag him back. Now, we know what that something is, but that something is actually also quite large. Now, judging by the way uh, his head just gets yanked down into the side, I think internally in his suit, he literally has his head pulled off as a result of the creature trying to pull him back through. And I'm sure that would feel like a pleasant experience. So what would that take, I hear you asking? What, you never want to know the tensile strength of the human neck? That is completely ridiculous, you need to know. Essentially, with the load-bearing capabilities and what they come down to with the human neck, it's not so much the spine and spinal cord, or even the ligaments in the spine itself, because those are going to sever long before the muscle and skin tears. But it really comes down to how well the muscle can stay together in the face of pulling forces. So it's known that the ligaments of the spine will fail at around 1800 newtons, whereas muscle will begin tearing around 4800 newtons, but it's also dependent upon if the muscle is activated and not tensed, with necks exhibiting like that tension at 4800 newtons and relaxed necks failing at around 3000 newtons. Of course, if your spine is severed up near the C1 vertebrae, it is likely the muscle would be relaxed as it's not receiving information. Of course, the other side of that is, like with paralysis, it will sometimes cause all muscles to contract really, really hard at once due to the lack of direction by the brain and spinal cord. Now, what would 4,800 newtons be in pound force? Basically, pounds being applied as force. So in this case, you can think of it like a pulling force, pulling with the weight of X being applied. In this case, 4,800 newtons would be like adding an extra 1,079.1 pounds or 489.46 kilograms attached to your feet with your neck keeping you in place. And that is how much pound force it would take to tear a head completely off body. And that is a lot of force. For a non-tensed neck, however, it would be around 674.42 pounds or about 305.9 kilograms. Still a tremendous amount of force being applied even for the muscle that is just existing connected. So at this point they nope out of there because nobody wants that to happen to them as they discuss how he was quite literally ripped out of his suit. And now that we have discussed what it would take to rip a body away from a head, that's gonna be one thing, but to pull open one of these suits which resists tremendous pressures to implode or explode would take way more than what would be required to just rip somebody's head off. Presumably these suits are put together to the point that they're meant to also potentially resist deep sea life such as anglerfishes and uh, basically also help you not be eaten by sharks. For something to pull this suit apart could easily dismember a person with very little issue. So Emily at this point starts talking about how they did this. They took too much and now she's taking back. Like, all right there, Emily. I think you're personifying the monsters a little too much. It's an animal, not an equivalent exchange. Or could she potentially be onto something? We're going to figure that out here in a moment when we actually see the adults. Pulling Smith's oxygen scrubber, they realize his suit's not going to make it. Smith is having feelings of like, oh, I'm just going to stay back because, I mean, you know, his suit isn't working. He only can take short, shallow breaths when they're actually moving through the water because that's all the air he has in his suit. So I get his sentiment, but bro, just like thug it out or something. You would think these things would also have like a hookup to allow the suits to share oxygen, and you would think that you could open a door from both sides, but no. I mean, even scuba gear has an emergency respirator. So as they continue walking along the bottom of the ocean, Nora hears something as she spots the creature run after getting her light on it. It keeps buzzing the tower as the group then draws closer to one another because, uh, <laughs> I don't want to get picked off. As Nora stands there, Smith gets grabbed as Emily screams for help. 
Running after him, they can't find Smith at first, but eventually spot him suffocating in a rock formation. The captain then gets grabbed and dragged off with Nora as they are tethered. They hit the structure as Nora tries to free the captain, and they look around and see the creature is approaching them. Ooh, there's my handsome man. It tries to eat Nora's head, which shows us these creatures actually look pretty horrific, which let's take a look at them. First and foremost, while these creatures can walk on all fours or really crawl on all fours, this is likely more for the purpose of hanging onto the structure. So starting with the feet, we actually see this species is bipedal or could be bipedal, which is highly unusual being that this is in the deep ocean. Their feet are webbed and they appear to also have toes. So this is going to be difficult to see, so some pictures may have to be used, but moving up the leg, these creatures are actually not unlike humanity. You can see a large central tibial bone, assumedly at least it'll be there, so we can also maybe assume there's a fibular bone as well. The calf muscles on this creature are going to be stretched out, but they possess a knee much like a human does. Ascending up the leg to the thigh region, they are long and slender, much like how the lower leg, which connects to the pelvic region on humans, would have the same proportions and connection point concerning angle of the pelvis. From what we can tell, I believe there are actually maybe two species involved in this attack, but I'll explain later on. Moving to the abdominal region, it appears to have the standard setup that humans have actually. They have abdominal muscles but are not well defined and the skin on the chest looks loose as well. The shoulders are larger due to the fact that the creature swims and the arms are also long and slender, much like the legs, allowing it to kick and pull water around it to swim faster. The length of the arms indicates that they are integral for this swimming ability and the hands possess four fingers and a thumb with webbing in between the fingers. The head of this creature to me has a very human appearance or at least primate appearance minus the jaw. The upper skull has two eye sockets, but no eyes. The brow ridge is mostly smooth and flat and in line with a skull from what we have seen, and its jaw can open up to massive proportions to swallow a person entirely. This tells you the actual size of the creature as well. The average man of 5'9", based on models, only stacks up to around mid-thigh region. Two men would be around to the collarbone region, with an entire set of legs officially reaching the top of the head. This would put the creature at around 14 feet 4 inches, or 436.8 centimeters, but it also could be that the crew is like six feet tall, in which case, uh, this thing's gonna be like 18, 19 feet tall. This creature, when crawling around, does not look as large as it is, but it's actually massive compared to Homo sapiens, and this is why it appears that it can swallow a person entirely, as they would fit inside of the abdominal region quite easily, because it seems like more of a sack-like appearance. Now, would the acid be able to dissolve the suit? Very unlikely. At least, not in the time it would be taking for a person to be completely dissolved and not just tearing apart this creature from the inside. And this shows that while they may be more intelligent, they are likely no more intelligent than say like a chimpanzee. Smarter than average, but still just an animal. It appears the captain's suit may have been damaged though as when he got grabbed he started ascending way too quickly. Again, whoever designed these suits was sort of an idiot. I think because, uh, let's say you're ascending too quickly, this is going to cause the captain's suit to build up pressure too fast, right? You know what would fix that? A pressure relief valve for this exact scenario. But that doesn't exist on this suit for, I assume, some reason. So as Nora gets dragged up with him, the captain then cuts her loose so that they both don't meet their end, and he literally just explodes because of the pressure buildup. Nora is blasted back down to the depths by the explosion as she wakes up with critically low oxygen levels. Looking around, a cephalopod is there to greet her as it freaks her out and she's sort of lost. She eventually finds the shepherd drill and then heads inside with barely any oxygen left. Ditching the suit, she has a nice cry and what I can imagine is just freezing cold water as she calls out to the rest of the group but nobody answers. Like, again, I am absolutely leaving my suit on 100% of the time. Checking the lockers, I don't know why but everyone's stuff is still in the lockers like you would think they would have cleared that out but the captain's daughter actually had met her end at 11 years rather than 14 which he said that she was which is why he didn't care about going back up to the surface at all, like nothing was there for him. Very depressing stuff, thanks for watching. Aren't we having a great time? This is also why the captain earlier misremembered his offspring's age. Evidently, as discussed during times of adrenaline pump, you aren't going to necessarily remember the things that you've been telling people, and as a result, he let that one go by accident. Putting that depressing discovery uh, on the back burner, she sees a map and then closes the locker before, I don't know, having more of a freak out as she finds an older variant of the suit. She also finds a flare canister for under the water, as then she heads back out into the pure blackness towards Roebuck. 
Nora then hears M mentioning something on the radio as she calls out, but Emily doesn't answer. She's talking with someone as she finds Emily and then tackles her. Nora tells her to open her eyes as she says, he's still alive. Who, Smith? The guy is like not suffocated yet? So as they walk, Emily talks about how she feels high, which there's a reason for that. Diving is something that is fun and actually makes you feel like you are flying and can make you feel high as flying too. When breathing in oxygen at high pressures, which is what you would need at that depth, it can result in something known as oxygen toxicity. I know, isn't that wild? We breathe in this stuff, yet it can be toxic to us. In fact, there's always like, it's not confirmed or anything, but there's this joke that basically says, what if we breathe in oxygen for 80 years and that's how long it takes to kill us? I mean, oxygen is a fairly dangerous chemical and we use it to power our bodies. So, I mean, who knows? But as you breathe in this mixture, it results in hyperoxia. Not to be confused with hypoxia, which is a lack of oxygen. Breathing this in will produce a feeling of lightheadedness and can actually damage your lungs if you continued breathing in this mixture for an extended period of time. And you can actually kind of do this right now. Like, I'm not trying to like kill you or anything. Make sure you're sitting for this. You take in several deep breaths quickly, like 10, and you'll feel what starts to feel like hyperoxia set in. Don't freak out though, just hold your breath like a few seconds afterwards and your body will rapidly burn through the oxygen and you'll return back to normal. Now the other possibility, considering they haven't been out of the water in some time, is that they are low on oxygen and they are experiencing hypoxia. She also mentions how she can't feel her fingers. That could be the cold water, but it also could be the lack of oxygen because she's not properly perfusing the most distant points of her body but it may be that the CO2 buildup in the suit is meaning they're getting less oxygen with each breath, and with exertion of pulling Smith, this may also induce the same effect. Basically, you are killing some brain cells as oxygen becomes less available, because remember, your brain needs roughly 20% of that oxygen that you take in, and the brain is absolutely the greediest organ you have, and will sacrifice your fingers before it sacrifices its own oxygen supply. But to waste more oxygen and pass the time, Emily starts asking about who Nora's with and what's her fiance like, which actually that was Smith's friend. They always enjoyed diving together, but this time he went alone because she was tired. Eventually enough time passed that she called search and rescue, but they never found him. Emily talks about loving Smith as they drag him towards the Roebuck. Then they see the glow in the distance, knowing that they've reached the Roebuck 6.9 miles below the surface. Emily at this point starts mega running out of oxygen. As they approach, they spot the creatures at the entrance. They aren't moving, however, so they shut their lights off and then try to move through. Nora thinks they are sleeping or potentially even hibernating. As they make their way through, Emily's suit starts screaming about the low oxygen levels and how they're critical, which is great timing as a hand descends on Nora. She keeps telling them to move towards the door without her as she gets yanked up into the ceiling by one of these creatures and attacked. So it starts going Callisto Protocol on her, consuming her whole head as she enters the primordial pouch that the creature has. Of course, Nora ain't going out like no scrub like Jacob Lee, so firing a shot, she introduces the creature into man's answer, immediately releasing her. Looking around though, there are more of these things, and if she had a knife, she could like absolutely let these things like eat her and then just cut her way out to be honest. But as they all wake up, Nora sees something massive in the distance. Firing a flare, a leviathan-like creature has been watching her the whole time, which okay, that's my literal nightmare. Like we don't ever really get to see the whole thing, but this creature is massive. So we have finally reached the point to talk about like what I want to talk about and why I believe this is a dual species event. First, the youngling that they captured for a moment uh, it could have been something like a progression into an adult form where they eventually grow legs to replace the tendrils that they have. But as we see this massive creature, well, we have to use a picture of it. It also appears to possess the same tendrils. And what we will also see is the bipedal version appears to come off the skin of the Leviathan. So what is going on? First, humanity very clearly drilled into a pocket of the planet and released these things. At the bottom of the sea is where these would have to live. The creature is larger than anything that we have seen before or that we know of on Earth, and it has tendrils like all over its body. This is quite literally you and the Dark Lord Cthulhu, which if this is a supernatural event, that means this is an eldritch creature defying human comprehension, blah, blah, blah. That's boring, but that's why the smaller bipedal version of Cthulhu could very well be a bastardized human form. However, to me as a biologist, I still think this has its roots in a more natural setting. Because honestly, the whole supernatural aspect is such a cop-out. Things that can exist in reality are way scarier. So let's start from the youngling that was taken to be examined. This creature clearly is offspring. Now there's a whole lore associated with it, but as far as we know, there are four members noted to be Cthulhu's offspring, and I'm gonna butcher all these names. We have Gahantathoa, Thorgtha, Zoth Amog, and Stilthia. And like, it sounds like I have a list there, but that's literally how it looks like it's pronounced. But this random offspring located in the depths eating its man, which isn't named. 
I do not believe it is related to the larger creature as a result, and according to the models, the tendrils will progress into becoming legs as the creature ages. So sort of like its puberty is the formation of legs. If this creature is just reproducing, or at least the bigger one is, and is not based on the actual lore of Cthulhu, that means that this is really just a random species. The thing to remember about the deep sea is, and apparently the large contained mass of water that was just found, it is completely possible there may be pockets of water under the earth that could be entirely sealed off. Potentially through enough time or events such as tectonic plate shifting, imagine like something deeper than the Mariana Trench existing on earth for a long time when megalodons existed amongst many other giant ocean dwelling beasts, such as like even a mosasaur. It becomes easier to rationalize the thought that something like this giant squid-like creature could have existed as well, which fun fact, the colossal squid was dismissed for a very long time even after damage to ships was observed until we accidentally caught it on camera, confirming the thing was real. If this creature existed in an ancient part of the ocean and somehow was sealed off from the rest of the ocean in a pocket of the crust that may have like had an earthquake that then brought the top of the trench together but allowed for a vast area to remain as liquid water below, it may be that this creature is in fact not the Dark Lord, but a leftover ancient species humanity has yet to encounter. Which isn't really that weird for us, it happens all the time, especially at the bottom of the sea. After breaking through this ancient section of seabed, looking for oil, this creature was released after all that time, or at least potentially a descendant was. To us, it would immediately seem like it was a supernatural event, but I mean, to me, this just seems entirely plausible that it was natural. But I can hear you. What about the creatures that exist with it? Those are clearly humanoid looking, and to a degree, I agree with you. I mean, just take a look at their fingers and thumbs. I mean, that is not a natural formation for something that's under the water. This species has a huge tell as to what it used to be. The eye sockets that are devoid of eyes now kind of give this away. We see leftover eyes on some deep sea fish which gleans any light possible in an area, but those are still useful. This species that was sealed away would have access to no light, but it's clear they come from an area that obviously did have light. It's sort of like the idea that humans locked away in caves, in movies and stuff, have their eyes uh, basically disappear because they're completely useless. The absorption of an organ, but the leftover cavity in the bone, is seen in many animals who live in complete darkness, like at least troglodytes who live in caves exclusively, and they traded it for another trait such as echolocation rather than eyesight. But with these creatures, I defer to the aquatic ape theory to help explain their being. The aquatic ape theory essentially shows that some time ago apes began entering the water to hunt. Much like how a blue whale actually used to be a land dwelling animal that entered the waters long ago and then became ocean dwelling. And also, it, you should note this, it literally goes to the depths of water that is completely devoid of life and just likes hanging out down there. Then I think it wouldn't be too far fetched to think that the apes entering the water may have done a similar thing. Because again, this has already happened in other species. These aquatic apes may have spent so much time in the water hunting, and by moving deeper and deeper into areas, their bodies would begin to adapt to that environment. And as the water got colder, eventually there may have been adaptations that allowed them to grow in size, reaching these staggering sizes that they are compared to humans, as a larger body is harder to cool down, maintains its heat better, and metabolisms are more efficient. And if we take a look at this leviathan thing, I think this is a completely different organism given its tail. What would be the purpose of these proposed aquatic primates, gone full aquatic I guess, to then reform a tail after the tendrils became legs? So you might be asking yourself, is Roanoke a crackhead? Yes, thanks for wondering that. These videos are kind of like rapidly becoming uh, speculation and theoretical as to like how these things came to be and are quite unlike the videos of diseases that I cover, but it's, you know, it's fun. But to explain these creatures' affinity for the larger creature, you have to look no further than what sharks do. The ocean is a very dangerous place, and like the phrase that confused treants, or ints, or whatever they are in Lord of the Rings, the closer we are to danger, the further we are from harm. You see, fish that would normally be prey all the time, swimming right up against a shark, because it's safe there despite being right next to a dangerous predator, was an actual survival technique and I believe these aquatic apes did the same thing. After descending into the waters, over time, many would be eaten by the horrors that were in the dark, until likely they would find this creature swimming around. It may also be that they stuck around megalodons and leopleurodons and mosasaurus and everything else that was giant, but as those died off, the only species left was this giant one trapped within the crust with them. Upon its release, it would then head upwards towards the bottom of the ocean, where it would just bring these creatures with it as they stuck near it. And really, I believe it is that simple. 
Now, obviously, to support this large creature and all the trapped aquatic apes with it, that would require several things. First, the aquatic apes are fully aquatic, meaning that they get their oxygen from the water and not just ascending and taking a breath and then coming back down like other land-based animals that return to the water did. Second, there would need to be an entire ecosystem of life there trapped along with the animals, and the area would be massive to allow for such animals to exist. Now also, they do appear to hibernate in times where there's no food around, so this is also something that's going to keep them alive in terms of there's not a lot of food. But a basic food web is pretty easy to construct. Microorganisms eat the material coming out of hydrothermal vents that is then eaten by plankton, that is then eaten by a smaller fish, which is eaten by a bigger fish, which is eaten by a giant fish, which is eaten by a colossal fish, which is then eaten by this leviathan. This food web would also be a snapshot of the environment at the time as well, allowing for such a massive creature to thrive, and it's entirely likely that there are really not many of these creatures patrolling the area, seeing as it would require a lot of nutrition. And then the creatures that are actually the aquatic apes that are attached to this leviathan would basically either, either they are parasitic in nature and are sucking the blood out of this larger creature, or they're eating the scraps that inevitably would come about it essentially being torn apart by the leviathan. But this colossal fish may also be why the aquatic apes stick close to the leviathan, as there is still absolutely something that would eat them if they strayed too far. So as it attacks the robot, causing an explosion much like at the other facility, Nora is able to get into the airlock as Emily opens her helmet before she suffocates in her suit. Again, a pressure stabilizer or something would have solved all of these issues. As the three head towards the pod on the roebuck, they see the creature is outside. It attacks the tunnels, trapping them as they move around to the back and towards the pods. Finding two, they put Smith in one and Emily in another, as the third pod is broken and non-operational. They give Smith a uh, little paw and blast him up to the surface as Emily goes into her pod, but she realizes Nora isn't returning with him. Nora is then forced to punch Emily in the face to get her into her pod, as then she sealed in and blasted up towards the surface, grabbing the attention of the Leviathan. Nora sits in the roebuck as it's having some structural issues as she starts monologuing about having a choice and the creatures are also trying to break in. As the leviathan roars, all the creatures start exiting off of its body and Nora sees that they are chasing the pods upwards as she goes to detonate the core and take out everything down there, including herself. But the leviathan can suck it in the process, so it's kind of an equivalent exchange. So then we get the ending where the company refuses to let the people talk about what happened. It says that there were only two survivors of the disaster, meaning the 22 people sent up by the captain at the beginning were all torn apart by the creatures, which they basically just sent to their doom. And you may be wondering how that also is possible. Remember, escape pods are going to make a lot of noise. And given that these creatures don't have any eyes, I would absolutely say they either hunt by vibrations that are being sent through the water. And I think that with these creatures, it's probably not a form of echolocation, but much like what sharks have, which is a lateral side of their body, which has a ton of nerve endings that can detect movement in the water. These creatures likely have that and anything moving through the water, such as escape pods is going to essentially rustle their jimmies so that they'll attack it and then see what it is. Now we actually saw this behavior when Nora launched the escape pods and the aquatic apes started giving chase. That's a bummer. But anyhow, they resumed drilling, which is supposed to be like, oh, they're sending people into a meat grinder. However, obviously the company will likely put up countermeasures at this point to deal with a Leviathan threat. And really, I mean, that's the most human thing imaginable. You break our toys, we break your species. And thus concludes Underwater. But anyhow, I want to thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed, then leaving a like would be very awesome of you as uh, these are getting really longer, I've noticed lately. So it's taking a lot of energy, but subscribing is also a great way to stay up to date on when I post. I post usually about twice a week. Also want to hear what you guys think. Is this actually a Cthulhu or is this just basically a natural species? I, for one, think it's a natural species, but let me know down in the comments. Also, uh, I do have merch now. If you go to roanokemerch.com, you can find that. It's somebody who actually makes good shirts uh, as opposed to those craptacular shirts that I had for a while, which is why I shut down merch to begin with. But I'll drop my Twitter, Discord, Patreon, channel links to the merch and also the Rono Tales channel link, where this week we are talking about the Frederick Valentich alien interaction. It's pretty interesting. But also speaking of patrons, I'd like to thank mine real quick. First, huge thank you to our two astronauts, Rosie Kinch and Elliot Roska. Thank you guys very much. I'd also like to thank our astrophysicist, Death Dancer, as well as our scientist, Chad, the enjoyer of explanations of B-grade horror movies, Florian, Lacune, Lucian Dragon, and Octavia Serpentia. And the rest of my patrons, I thank you guys as well. Your help goes a long way towards keeping this channel running. It is greatly appreciated. All right, so that's going to do it for me. I hope everyone enjoyed, and I'll see y'all in the next one.